Well, it's hard to top the late great Anthony Bourdain <laughs> or to follow that. Um, but uh, we've got some great folks here to talk about uh, this film, and so I just want to introduce them, and then I'll ask each of them a question or two, and then we're going to turn it over to you and hear what's on your mind. Um, so let me start. On my right, um, Eileen Laponis is the executive director of the New Hampshire Food Bank. Uh, she uh, is very familiar with The Face of Hunger, as I think was mentioned in that movie. After receiving her undergraduate degree from Boston College and a bunch of years in finance in the Boston area, uh, Eileen came to New Hampshire to pursue her MBA at UNH. And then she graduated and went on to run a business accelerator at Pease. Uh, then she switched over to the nonprofit sector and took on the position as development director for the Arts Integrated Public Charter School that her oldest daughter attended. And she realized that all these uh, charter schools uh, needed advocacy and support, and so she founded the New Hampshire Public Charter School Association. And 10 years later, there's uh, more than two dozen public charter schools here in New Hampshire, uh, which is a good thing, providing expanded education options for families in New Hampshire. Now, we're lucky to have her as the executive director of the New Hampshire Food Bank, where Eileen recognizes the intersection between hunger and health, and she's partnering with New Hampshire healthcare providers uh, to reach more of the food insecurity, to meet, reach more of the food insecure with healthy, nutritious food um, to impact their health. Uh, New Hampshire Food Bank is a great organization, and we're very lucky to have Eileen here. So welcome, Eileen. Thank you. In the middle, uh, Jessica Satterley Hall, uh, who is the founder and the CEO of Upper Valley Compost Company. Um, she is somebody who is trying, as the movie said, to use the capitalist system to help address the issue of food waste, and she'll tell us about some of the opportunities and struggles there. Uh, Jessica got her undergraduate degree in English literature from Dartmouth College. Um, I also went to Dartmouth and got my undergrad in American history, and neither of us is doing anything remotely associated with our undergrad. It's worked out okay. Go humanities. <laughs> All right. Uh, she's got an MBA from Cornell, and she spent 15 years working in the food, agriculture, and grocery businesses, and has held positions in product development, marketing, and operations. Um, she's on the board of directors of the Hanover Consumer Cooperative Society, which has more than 20,000 members and is one of the, mo the oldest and most successful co-ops in the U.S., and she lives in Lebanon. Um, and uh, all the way on my, uh, to my right is Matt Lewis. Um, Matt is the chef and the owner of Moxie and the Franklin Oyster House, which are two uh, highly acclaimed restaurants in Portsmouth. You should go there if you haven't been. Uh, Matt's a native of New Hampshire. He's a protege of Chef Thomas Keller. I trained at the French Laundry and was part of the opening team at Per Se. These are serious restaurants. Um, <laughs> and he returned home to New Hampshire to our good fortune, and he met a restaurateur, Jay McSherry, who is a great supporter of the Nature Conservancies. Um, and they opened the Moxie and Franklin Oyster House uh, to bring reviews. Uh, he creates modern American tapas at Moxie. Uh, does a lot of sourcing of local ingredients uh, and creates uh, really inventive and contemporary cuisine. And at the Franklin Oyster House, not surprisingly, he serves the bounty of the, of the sea. Um, does a lot of locally sourced oysters from Great Bay, where uh, those of you who know the Nature Conservancy know we've done a ton of work, and participates in the oyster shell recycling program. Um, if he's not on the line in the kitchen, he can be found weeding the restaurant's farm plot or mucking for oysters in Great Bay. Um, good, a good way to spend some time. So let me give you guys this mic, and I'm going to start with you, Matt. Um, so you're the chef and the owner of these two restaurants. Um, in your experience, what have you seen as some of the industry trends around food waste, and, and what are you doing to minimize food waste in, in your places? Well, I just want to say um, thank you for everybody coming. Thank you for having um, having us here as part of this because it is a very important um, movie and subject, um, and it's really special to be part of this. Um, you know, it's a big topic, and I think that everything that was just covered in the movie is far more um, 
intelligent than I could put into words I've seen. I'm like, geez, I'm not sure I'm qualified to be up here. <laughs> um, but thinking about a lot of this stuff, a lot of the trends I would say using that word is a lot of it is really, really honing in on the local, which is funny because it's kind of a, a marketing buzzword that everybody wants to eat local, but it, it's almost the root of the beginning of, of minimalizing food waste in the restaurant context because if we're focused on what our neighbors are growing, the people in our community are growing, and using that, whatever it may be, we're inadvertently minimalizing food waste without even trying and thinking about it. And then finding ways to use those products and underutilized products and species and get them on the menu so that we're not bound by the norms that maybe we think of when going out to restaurants and being able to highlight other products. Yeah, so let me follow up on that. So um, in the film, there was a couple of chefs who talked about this. One of the chefs, Dan Barber, he says one of his jobs is to introduce diners to new tastes. Um, one of the other chefs, Danny Bowian, says his responsibility is to ask this question if something sounds off-putting. How can you make it something that people freak out about and want to order? Um, so what kinds of new dishes are you bringing to your diners? And, you know, how, what are you trying to make them freak out about and want to order? Yeah, it's, it's funny that um, you know, Danny mentioned that because the name game, I call it the name game, it's something that's I found is kind of important to our restaurant and being able to um, market these underutilized species. And for some reason I'm good at it, maybe I drink too much tequila when I'm writing menus, I'm not sure. Um, but we have fun with it. So things like um, dogfish, for instance, is maybe the most abundant um, seafood in the local waters in the Atlantic Ocean, but nobody here will touch it at all in, in, in England and Great Britain. It's, it's widely used, but so we'll do things like call it um, New Hampshire beer battered shark bites. I can't keep it in the door. And I'm not lying, you know, there was a conversation with Mario Vitali about, you know, him saying that David Pasternak was lying about it. I, I don't lie about it. I'm not sure if David Pasternak was lying about some things. I don't think he was, but Dogfish is a type of shark, so by just using that word a little bit more, and then things like we use pollock and cusk, these other fish that people want haddock and cod, but pollock and cusk, you, you probably can't even tell the difference in a blind tasting. So on the menu, we'll write things like fish from our friends. Like that's how the menu reads. It doesn't even say what it is. It says fish from our friends, and then whatever it goes with, and like, oh, they're the fish is from their friends, it, it must be good. <laughs> and another one that we um, were doing recently was uh, kohlrabi. It's a, it's, a, it's a root vegetable. It's very, it's very hard to sell on its own, kohlrabi. I, mean, I found if you put lobster with anything, you can sell it, it doesn't matter. Um, but we really wanted to highlight the, the kohlrabi, so we did it in a way that I, I wrote it as, this was probably after too much tequila, I wrote rabbi tots, kohlrabi tots. So they're basically like french fries made out of Kohlrabi, but using some interesting wording that catches people's eye, makes them laugh a little, and then like, what the hell, I gotta order it anyway, it's just got my thoughts on it. Um, so we're always looking for that interesting wording to find ways to, to warm people up to it. A lot of times we'll take some of these underutilized products and pair them with something that people might be a little more familiar with, like green crab, for instance. You can't sell green crab on its own, but it's one of the most important food products that we need to be using right now out of the Atlantic Ocean. So we'll serve that as a sauce or a broth and make risotto out of it. And then ideally it tastes good. People say, oh, this is so good. What is it? And then we can open the dialogue about green crap from there. That's great. Marketing. Marketing is key, right? Tequila. <laughs> so Jessica, I'll switch it over to you. You founded Upper Valley Compost and now the New Hampshire Compost Company. Um, I'm curious, and probably some people here are curious, uh, why compost? Like, why did you start this business? Uh, it's a great question that I ask myself sometimes at 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm worrying about compost and uh, food waste in general. But I, I think the answer is that a lot of, one of the things this movie pointed out really well is that um, we have broken a natural cycle essentially. The, there is a natural carbon cycle, which is the basis of all life on this planet. We have effectively broken it. Uh, we take nutrients and uh, matter out of the soil. We um, then throw it in a landfill where it cannot sort of be reincorporated into the circle of life. Um, that is a very troubling, upsetting fact. Um, and I think that for me, 
I had worked in food and agriculture for many years, and in many ways I'm a graduate of one of these sort of edible schoolyard type programs. Um, and that was my first exposure to these things was through um, Dartmouth College's organic farm program. And I think it's true that once you see this cycle, once you see how it functions, it is very upsetting to see things wasted. Um, so I had always composted, and um, I think I was aware that a lot of people out there wanted to do something. We all want to help somehow um, in terms of the things we know are wrong, and it can be really hard to know what to do. Um, and composting, to me, is a very accessible way to start helping. It's a very easy thing to start doing, um, particularly if you make it easy, which is what our company strives to do, um, is to provide services um, to help residential customers compost who you know, currently can't compost for any number of reasons. Um, so to me, it was an opportunity to participate in, in breaking a very fundamental cycle that supports life on this planet um, and allowing other people to help. Uh, so that, that was that was how I got started. Also, I'm a gardener and I wanted free compost, so that was part of it. <laughs> and uh, what happens to the compost that you uh, produce? It's an interesting question with a there's a there's a pretty answer. There's the marketing answer. If you want to think of it that way, and then there's the the non-marketing answer. Um, and I would like to share both with you because I think it's one of the things this movie points out is the importance of um, our culture turning around what we think is pretty and what we think is um, appealing and broadening our understanding of that a little bit. So um, we do a couple of different things with our compost. Some of it um, is fed to worms and gets turned into vermicompost, which is a wonderful soil amendment, worm castings, for those of you who are gardeners. Um, some of it gets composted on farms and um, turned back into the soil. And um, quite a lot of it gets turned into fairly low-grade compost um, at the Lebanon transfer station. And that is the um, unattractive answer. Because the trick is, we produce so much of this material that to change our system from a fundamental level requires huge shifts. And that requires a lot of land, and land is very expensive. And so we've chosen to partner with other folks who have the resources to um, make the compost. And then it gets um, fed back now to the Lebanon Parks and Recreation Department. So that's one of the things that happens to it. So the Lebanon Park, Parks and Recreation Department uses it to, on the trees around the city of Lebanon, sort of to um, do soil amendments in area that need um, their soil to be um, improved. And I think what people want the answer to be is they want it to be that we're turning it into this wonderful compost that then, you know, everybody will buy and it goes into your gardens. And that is the ideal. That is absolutely the ideal. But the truth is that the economics of these things are really hard, particularly in a place like New Hampshire. And so um, there's not a lot of people out here who would necessarily want to pay $20 for a bag of compost. And that's the kind of... Um, I think this movie does a really great job of pointing out that the economics of these situations are really tricky, and one of the things we need to do as um, citizens is be willing to pay what it costs to fix our system. Um, and if we can't do that, we need to talk to our um, uh, representatives and get them to change systems that are preventing us from uh, shifting those economics. So I think there's, there's, there's pretty answers and there's less pretty answers. <coughs> And I hope that it's helpful to hear both. Well, thank you for the honesty. And I think uh, this movie does a lot of you know, pulling back the curtain on things that uh, we don't always want to see or, or certainly don't understand. And so like, I'm going to turn it over to you, Eileen. You, you run the New Hampshire Food Bank. And so now you're, you're at that top slice uh, of that food pyramid that uh, was up there on the screen. Food waste is on your mind a lot. And we see in this movie how supermarkets are trying to create this appearance of infinite abundance. Um, as a Hanford shopper, I see that quite a bit, um, by stocking more food than they know they can sell. So why don't you tell us about your food rescue program, and how it works, and what stores participate? Sure. Um, we partner with all the major New Hampshire grocers and uh, many independents as well. Um, we are part of Feeding America, one of the 200 food banks in the country. And because of that, we have pretty rigorous food safety training that are, um, we have, we're like the backbone of charitable food distribution in the state. 
and we have 435 agencies, which are the food pantries, the soup kitchens, the after-school feeding programs, senior programs, many different types of feeding programs that are our agencies that reach our food insecure. And for those agencies that are close to us, we are able to do the, the rescue. And for those agencies that are further away, um, we have training specifically designed to directly enable them to pick up the food donations at the grocery stores. And so it prolongs the shelf life and lowers the carbon footprint. There's no sense in it coming all the way from Lebanon down to Manchester for us to redistribute it. Um, so that has been significant uh, and able to get more groceries to the, our, our agencies. And also recently, within the past few years, protein's been a, a very difficult source. And so grocery stores have started a fresh rescue program where they will freeze stuff right before it goes and then expires. And then they bring it to us frozen and we sort it. And many of the programs um, that we have, one of which is our culinary training program. And we have a production kitchen that produces 500 meals a day. And they always go, the majority of them go to the Boys and Girls Club in New Hampshire and um, senior feeding programs as well. And so we partner with them, but I'll be honest, it's a, it's a difficult partnership. Um, way too often, I'm feeding pigs. I got anywhere between four to 10 watermelon bins a week that go to a pig farm. I want to have my own pig farm. <laughs> um, before I saw this movie, I had my own pig farm. Um, but that type of waste and the partnership that we have with them is a double-edged sword. While I also, I want the protein from the Fresh Rescue Program, I have to take the soda and the chips. So it's a, it's, it's a difficult balance. And as the grocery stores are going to zero waste, and as the technology has really increased the efficiency of supply chain logistics, there's less and less overage, there's less and less donations to us. And so what we are doing is seeing that we have to buy more. But with that buying comes the power that we can buy what we want our food insecurity. And so we're changing, it's kind of a paradigm shift within the food banking industry where we're really able now, we're not at the back of the warehouse with our tin can saying, we'll take whatever you got. We're introducing food nutrition policies and we're saying, no, we really don't want your soda. So we just had a recent donation from Pepsi and I was like, I'll take your fruit juice, you can keep your soda. So that type of relationship and that balance is something that is very difficult for us, but we do the best that we can. We make sure that if we can't use it, that it does go to the, the pig farmer. And um, we're taking as much as we can and using it also in our programming so that nothing goes to waste. Well, thank you for that like, behind the scenes look. Um, I'm going to ask Eileen one.